Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of So How'd You Get Here? Coming to you from Hollywood, California. My name is Angelo. And I'm Tony. And today we have a guest, which I will not introduce because um, apparently you're good friends with him. I mean, yeah, I've known the guy for about 15 years. He's a... uh Fellow East Coaster, Yale grad, he's uh, written The Breakup, he's written and directed The Wedding Ringer, also now owns a high school in upstate New York that he made into a movie studio, it is called American High. Welcome to the show, Jeremy Gerlich. I'm very happy to be here, thank you guys. Tony, um, uh, thank you for that introduction, um, I uh, have known you for, for close to, maybe even more than 15 years, we, yeah. we were, uh, I don't remember we, when we we've, started. we've uh, played on the uh, Beverly Hills Ninjas, um, perennial flag football team ever in the state of California. That is that is true, well, we I don't know greatest, but nope, we definitely greatest. had the, the best uh, swag, um, and we had uh, the greatest captain, greatest uh, Rawson Thurber, who, and we had the best uniforms, we had the best photographer, we, we had a drone operator. We we're we we're big. Yeah, you, we had like you the have best a pair outfits. of you have a nunchucks at home or I have nunchucks. Or I have a sword. sword. I have a sigh. I have the amount of weapons. Throwing yeah. stars. Weapons. You have throwing stars. Throwing stars. <sighs> my kids. John Wick two over here. My kids are literally like walking in my bedroom and they're like, "Where's the nunchucks? Where's the throwing stars?" <laughs> I have three boys who are now. I my oldest is thirteen and I have twins who are eleven. Like. I can't for for some reason Rawson was just giving giving us all these weapons. And then our season. last season, we all got like retirement watches because we were never going to oh, play. Yeah, you all got, got like, injured. Fancy Didn't watches, you yeah, get injured? Like, like, from like a fancy <laughs> like, watch like place. Shinola watches from like Detroit. And we just, I mean, he literally was like we were like in a construction union and we were retiring. I felt like Paulie from from Rocky. It was insane at the meat factory. That was crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know why. Like we had the best. It was he. He was Rawson's incredible. He was the best uh, captain. We never uh, won. <laughs> no, we won we, games. We didn't win the championship. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we always came we, in yeah. third or second. Yeah. To jump, we'd lose to Jump Man. And, I yeah. the, and Steve Cohen, what's Steve Cohen's team? I'm assuming they had probably loaded up the team with ex-professional football players. And we cheated. also had uh, $35 million in probably, what, medical bills for injuries? Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, but we had a great crew. We just had a great crew, yeah. and it's really fun. I mean, we could probably spend the next two hours talking about uh, the just Beverly that. Hills Ninjas. Yeah. That should um, be another podcast. We'll we're start gonna do that. the Beverly Hills Ninjas, Ninjas podcast. On another day? We'll yeah, a lot of, like, Ross and Thurber. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah. Bo Flynn, uh, Brandon Jacoby, Eric Christian Olsen. We had a ton of guys. Yeah, Drew Simon. Yeah, like, Drew Simon. Some, like, everyone, uh, Jeff Hobbs. Like, just Michael like, Doniger. Doniger. now Andy Garcia's son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> How it's crazy just, is that? Yeah. How do you get on this team? Is there an audition? Do you just submit a headshot? You have to audition. <laughs> you, have you do. To audition. You have to audition. <laughs> well, it's it's you have to perform a monologue I, while running a football. I don't know. I just, I just remember like 15 years ago being asked to come out and play, and yeah. I just you know was was I, you said yes, and then I said yes, and suddenly we were. I was in second and third place for the next 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> and getting every uh, muscle and joint and bone replaced in my body. Yeah, You're like the bionic man. But anyway, uh, thank you for for having um, having me on. I appreciate it. this place is incredible. Um, thank you, I thank love, you. I love what you guys do. Appreciate I love what it. you do here. Thanks for taking out a few hours of a very busy schedule. I know you're closing deals and selling scripts and doing all that, but you came. Well, to... Not closing deals and selling scripts today. Not you today. Because they today is the first day of the WGA That's writer right. strike. We all so, support the, the Writers um, Guild. I'm I'm on break now. I'm yeah. about to go pick it at uh, Fox Studios. That's why you're here. That's how we got you. Well, I was uh, I was born and raised in Rockland County, New York, in a place called New City, which is the county seat of Rockland County. Very okay. uh, just for all the listeners who were wondering. <laughs> Um, I went to Yale and uh, was was uh, where you grew up, right? Yeah. Where you grew up, right around in like New two Haven. towns away from New Haven. I was born at Yale New Haven Hospital, so I was in the building. My first it didn't make me any smarter, but I was in the building. <laughs> my first uh, surgery, yeah. My first football injury was I had a Liz Frank injury, and I was ro- we were, I was playing against Dartmouth. I was on the six yard line um, right before the 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 uh, end of the first half, and I had a sweep left, and I was going, and I was I was tackle it my, my foot got caught in the, the grass and yeah. I was just tackling the batting line my um my foot snapped in half Oof. and I was brought to uh Yale New Haven Hospital and that's where they did my surgery they like re- reconstructed my left foot um also a good movie my left foot I don't know if you guys have seen it <laughs> very we similar have, yeah very I similar. thought you played Daniel yeah. Day-Lewis yes. for a second yes Daniel Day-Lewis um, I don't remember him in as so much as uh I remember him in um, There Will Be Blood. There yes. Was. Yeah. The first movie I saw him in was Last of the Mohicans. That was uh, so that good. Was, I thought he was Indian. And I thought he was. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Daniel Day Lewis, I just American. found out, was Jewish. 
Really? Or is Jewish? Oh, yeah, I didn't isn't know that? that. I, I, yeah, I didn't either. I, thought, I really. just knew he was Irish. Yeah, I nice thought he was accent. Irish too. We should send him a speed heave jersey yeah. as a and have you sign it. I, I, uh, <laughs> anyway, where were we? Yeah. I don't. This is going to be a fun. So interview. Yale, Yale <laughs> University. Oh, sorry. My, I do have. I'll just point out that I do have ADHD, uh, probably um, we'll, we'll, to the extreme. We'll, we'll so you guys need to kind of pull it in. Yeah. If I get I'm not sure I want to do that. I want to see where it takes us. So off back, uh, off track betting in the Himalayas. <laughs> um, okay, no, let's go back on the phone. <laughs> so where where were we? So did you so I had, major in drama? Or? No, oh. I, you know what? I, I was a football player. So I didn't know. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. I was just, just you know, I was in high school. I was having fun. But I, smart enough to get into Yale, I, clearly. I, I guess I was also just, I was I played football. I was recruited. I was a good, I was a funny right. I wrote a very funny essay to the point where um, the the uh, the coach who recruited me said, I remember this, he said, if you don't um, make it as a football player, he's like, I, I, you have a future as a writer. And I, that stuck with me. I didn't realize, I didn't really yeah. realize it until much later. Um, but I got into Yale and once I got into Yale, I was like, oh, like this is, this is kind of cool. I didn't realize how college was never an important thing in my house. It was never, I had never had any pressure. Isn't your sister a lawyer? It wasn't important. My sister's a lawyer. (laughs) My sister's a lawyer. She went to Princeton and then went to Columbia for law school. And my other sister went to Boston university, then like did her, did worked in, um, got her master's from Harvard in, in, in public, uh, health. Um, School's not important, but they all went to the Ivy Leagues. We we were never, (laughs) like, never any pressure. Like, it was never a thing. Like, I never had my parents telling me to, oh, you have to fill out your applications. You have to do your SATs. Like, it was my best friend was the one whose mom would, like, push me to do that. Because she's like, what? You didn't fill out your thing? Like, I remember having, she would go and type the, yeah, it just was something I never really took seriously. Because for me, it was, I, I, I just was of the mindset that, Wherever I go, it'll work out like it's supposed to be. Um, Got to college. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I was playing football. I was drinking beer. I was going to, you know, Nicky's and Sally's. Working on your writing career. Yeah, I got it. Um, And just enjoying life and kind of being, um, I was being, I was just exposed to just different types of people from different places and different walks of, of life that I was never exposed to where I was right. growing up. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to major. And I, I, you know, as a freshman, I took psych, you know, it was, it, we took easy a salive was, you know, I took that class. He was a psych professor, um, you know, rocks for jocks. It was a geology <laughs> course. I, I didn't ba- basic drawing. I ba- literally, these are Yale classes. Yeah. yeah these are the Yale syllabus? classes. I literally took, I, I would look at like when the, rocks um, for rocks for jocks. Rocks for I, jocks. I literally would look at when the finals were, I would look at the cell of the blue, they called it the blue book. And yeah. I would look at where the, f- when the finals were and how early I could get out. Like if the finals were like the first day of finals, I would take that course, right? <laughs> um, so that's how I chose everything my freshman year. And then I, freshman year, I went home and I worked, I was, I was selling, um, something called BodyWise. Have you heard of BodyWise? No. It was a network marketing scheme where uh, one of my older fraternity brothers got, he's like, hey, uh, you like uh, you like to take care of yourself. You like health, right? Um, <laughs> you should just check out this uh, BodyWise thing. He like He's like, you could make a lot of money. You could all do this thing. I basically got into a pyramid scheme um, from a trusted uh, older fraternity brother. Right. Um, Named Matt Gus, who Matt, if you're out there listening to this, uh, you you taught me an amazing lesson, um, which uh, I went home for over the summer, and all I did was walk around like trying to sell people, like sell my like my grandmother. I would literally like be selling pills, and people would just just to get me to shut up would just say, "Oh yeah, fine, I'll buy this stuff. Leave me like if you just leave me alone. Stop <laughs> stop trying to sell me this stuff." Um, and I'm like, no, you have to get on the call with the like yeah. three star network guy, like from Bodywise level five, because he's going to tell you how you could be like get a Ferrari in a year, <laughs> right? So like, I'm not just taking your money. I'm checking in on you. Like, are you taking the pills? Are you making the shakes? Is it delicious? How many people have you signed up? All this stuff. Um, so I realized I did fine. Like I was I was selling the stuff and making money. 
Um, but what I realized was I, nobody wanted to talk to me. Nobody wanted to be, a, <laughs> be around me because every I was just asking people like how they were doing with network with with body wise like, so not going to be a salesman check no i yeah. was i i was able to sell like that was the thing it was just an, i was i would sell everybody but then it was once i sold them but then you had no friends then you have no friends yeah yeah no friends um at some point i um at some point i started uh just working construction just to like get a job like just to right. to get through the summer and you I sold became, all of them body wise as well <laughs> i sold everybody Dude, body wise most healthy construction <laughs> um and then, uh, and then I was a lifeguard at a, a day camp. I was just trying to get through that summer to figure out what, you know, I, it, it was a little bit of a, a life learning summer yeah, where yeah. I just, I was a little bit down. I was kind of bummed. Um, it was really the first time the body wise, it was kind of the first time I felt like I had failed something uh, where I was just like, Oh, this, I can't believe that I yeah. am not already the like a right. level six you know body wise salesman selling other people like with their the f um can you still get this product because i would love to cut it into your podcast uh, you know body what wise uh, by jeremy actually that's why i'm down here i was hoping <laughs> that you guys can um would not only buy some body wise but you'd also i think you guys would do great selling you know just yeah. signing up brought to you by body i don't know if body wise still exists it was actually a pretty good product you know i took the set like the morning supplement okay we don't have to do that. <laughs> um so then I remember I went back to college. It was my sophomore year and everyone was talking about their summers. And I had a friend who did um, archaeology and he like, interned in Egypt and did some sort of archaeology um, internship. I had another friend who helped design flowers and gardens in San Francisco. And people just started talking about really interesting right. things this that they were the doing. The people that go to Yale do. But I didn't know, like, I wasn't exposed to any of that until, right. like, this. And I had this realization where I was like, um, like, the world is, is the world is bigger than, you know, my my small town right. of New City. Um, you could do things beyond, you know, being in construction or going to law school or becoming a, an accountant or a doctor or an, whatever. Um, you could do th kind of whatever you want. And it hit me where I was like, oh, what do I love? I love sports and I love movies. And I'd been making movies on my camera f from the time I was 12, 13 years old. I was the one always walking around with a v VHS, VHS camera. Oh. I was always editing stuff. I never the did camcorder. it. camcorder. Ooh. The old cam school. Big old school. And I had like the reel to reel, like, you know, those things where you press the button and you're like, just, and you're like, yeah. so. And you I can was, never get it to line up because it's like two seconds of spin up time always. to get it to line up right. Yeah. Oh. Oh, and I always had like the things in the middle, like those buzz, like weird things. Track that, marks. Yeah, I got you. Um. So you know, I I always loved movies and making them, but I didn't realize you could actually do that. I didn't realize like people made movies. I never right. realized it was a thing. I never realized it was a career. You know, you grow up in Los Angeles, people grow up around it. It's right. Like where I was growing up. It's a fo it's foreign to like think oh you look at the credits on a movie I never nobody ever stayed for the credits right. but now you're like you can't leave until the end of the credits because every single one of those people every one of those names that was a job people worked really hard for that movie now I realize like you can do anything in the movie industry yeah. anything that you love so I decided that I was going to um, I was going to figure out how to come out to, to, to Hollywood that next summer. I'm sorry, how old are you at this point? I am 47 years no. old. <laughs> at this point in the story, before before you came out to L.A., how old were you? I'm so old right now, I forgot. Uh, so how, sophomore how year, old you're probably what, 19, 20? I, I don't know how old are sophomores. I, I'm i trying to think. I, I was a sophomore. Yeah, I'm probably 19 or 20. Okay. Um, so I basically reached out to anybody and everybody I knew just to see if anybody had any connections and somebody I'd gone to high school with her older sister, um, named, uh, Hillary Friedman. Mm -hmm. Um, that was her, her maiden name. She was an assistant to, uh, she was an assistant in, on the, in the writer's room of Saved by the Bell, the new class. Okay. That's not the current right. Saved by the Bell remake. It was the, in between the old Saved yeah, by the I, Bell. I 
Saved by the Bell that goes to college. Then there was the Saved by the Bell, the new class. So she was, I knew she had gone to USC film and she became an assistant. She had a friend who worked as an assistant um, and to to Marty Katz. Uh, he was a producer at, at Disney um, and got my, she got my resume to him and um his name's Fred. I was, but she, so Fred uh, interviewed me over the phone and said, if you could be here by whatever the summer, like you can have this internship. So I said, great. And at the end of my sophomore year, I drove out to California um, and I'd saved up a lot of money. I was working um, at uh, during college. Well, I was you working. crushed the body. Body wise. Body crushed body wise. So you had all of that money to come out here. I with. crushed body wise. Well I played. had a lot of... Uh, it's a 4D chest. By right the there, way, people. I don't even have to, uh, I didn't even have to do anything at that point with BodyWise because all of my network was working for me and they could do the same for you guys too. I'm just <laughs> putting that out there. Um, it's passive income for years. Your children don't have to worry about it. Uh, so where was, where was I? You got, you got out to California. Dude, that's my fault. Are you, I at, not are, you at, oh. are you at Disney? Interning uh, at yeah, Disney? Yeah, so I go on, I'm, an, I'm interning at Disney and um, I get there and i um, it's me and two other interns. Marty Katz had just, he was a huge production, uh, a production guy for Disney. He worked on Titanic. He worked on, um, he, he, for years, he was a he was a production executive for Disney. And then he got a, a producing deal on the lot. Um, he had produced Man of the House with Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Chevy Chase. I was a huge Chevy Chase fan. He had produced Mr. Wrong with Ellen DeGeneres and Bill Pullman. Um, and I suddenly was in Hollywood. I was in his office and I was reading scripts. I was making coffee. I was playing racquetball with him. I was taking his car for, uh, to, uh, get gas into the car wash. I was getting dry cleaning and I loved every second of it. And I remember being handed a script and, um, I was given the script and, and I think it was, it was Fred who, who said, uh, you just, take a take a look at the script and t tell me what you think and I opened it up and I remember reading like interior police station day like three and I was just like oh my gosh like this is how this is how a movie is written this is so cool and I just started reading the script and I was just the first script I read I was like oh that's so cool and I just wrote what I thought you know I wrote coverage for the script and I gave it and they're like okay here's another one and I would read another one and as I started reading like as I was reading them, I started making notes and I, and I would be like, oh, wait, this doesn't make sense because this person said this earlier. This like this seems like it was a mistake or something. And then I was like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if this person said this and I like would write a joke or, oh, my gosh, wouldn't it be funny if like at this moment right <laughs> here, like the guy's script. suddenly like this car like crashed through a wall or something. And I would. So as the summer was progressed i started just making i was basically like writing notes on scripts but i i wasn't doing coverage i was just rewriting scripts as i was reading them at some point i said oh maybe i can do like i i didn't again it was nobody ever said oh you can be a writer if you just do x y and z it wasn't that like that didn't exist back then from where i um but having read a bunch of scripts i was like oh maybe i can do this and i started that summer writing a script, you know, I just started doing it and, um, I was, I was loving it. And once I knew what I wanted to do, once I knew like, this is what I want to do. When I went back to school, I was laser focused. I was mm. just like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to major in theater and I'm going to do a double major in theater and film. Um, the theater school there, like the drama school is the number one drama school in the world. Right. Uh, and people had been like studying for years to get in and preparing. And, and I just remember like I, I wrote a insane essay about Burt Reynolds mustache. And <laughs> I remember having to walk in for an audition and I wasn't an actor, but you had to audition right. and write, do a thing. And I just had, I like did this, I had long, I had like long college, nineties college hair with like a beard like this. I was a football player and like, I just remember like taking my hair and like putting it up like crazy. And I did this monologue and they just started laughing before I even said anything just cause I looked so different and weird, like compared to the people who 
like were right. going to the, Juilliard the, camp yeah. from the time they were, yeah, you know, seven Tessians. years old. Yeah. Exactly. So I was very different and they recognized that I, I was different and I made it. Um, and I, so I, I was very, I get very focused in the theater department um, and focused in the, the film department. I worked, I, at that point I worked just really hard and I was also work, my job in college was I worked in the AV department. So I, in the mornings I would go and I would deliver old VHS. I would take like monitors, load them up onto the van with like VHS things. And then I would go to classrooms and I would bring them into the classrooms. And then I'd go back into the van and I have to go. Then I'd go and like, I'd edit, I would do my own work. I would write. I would this edit. is when they were still using the, the RGB TVs on the, on the push thing oh, yeah. with the Velcro strap to hold oh, exactly it Exactly what it I is. got you. I so got you. like we had a van, we would open it yeah. up and we'd push the thing out. <laughs> By the way, I didn't even drive the van. Somebody else, like the, somebody else drove the van. I was just there to like schlep the stuff. So it took me like 15 to 20 minutes of work early in the morning because I would just drop everything there. Mm -hmm. And then I would go and I had to wait. Right to pick the stuff up at the end of the at the end of the class, so I would go and I would do all of my work from their the AV room, and I would edit my movies. I would be working on scripts. I was writing, but I would be getting paid for it. Mm. So then I would go and I'd pick them up and I'd move them to another classroom. Yeah. It would be another fifteen minutes, and I'd go back. Um, so once I knew what I was doing in college, like that was it. I knew that. This is this is was, is was what I want to do, and and I was preparing for my my next internship um, in in Los Angeles was with David Milch. Was this every summer? Yeah, so this would be this would have been my junior summer. Was there ever a time during the sophomore summer, junior summer, or even probably before the junior year that you were like, I'm going to transfer from Yale to USC, or you never? Just, okay, never. I I didn't I didn't even it wasn't even a thought okay. i didn't i didn't never thought you were like, like that. if i'm in la all the time i can meet no never okay. once thought of that okay. um i i never had i would never like think years yeah, yeah, yeah i'm never like thinking years in the future i'm never thinking any like major like this is gonna set me up for, ever okay At, like to this day i don't it's more just like what are we doing today what's gonna you know what's the next like week like what am i looking at what's ahead of me what's the next week right. look like right. how do we how do we tackle this next week and then opportunities come up and yeah. you know um you make choices but i've never like i was never making a grand plan in in my in my head i just knew that i was gonna be writing i was doing plays i was writing plays i would have the football team like be get drunk and come down to the plays that I wrote and they'd be like, Woo! <laughs> um, I was an odd, like I was an odd bird. I was a football player, yeah. theater, Jewish guy, you know, that it was just an odd, I was an odd combination. So anytime I would do something, unique. And, the word you're looking for is unique. unique. I, I was, you know, I, I was in a Venn diagram, <laughs> you know, I would be like the, in the middle of the, you can't see it. I'm doing a Venn diagram. Yeah. With all, Are you doing all, sock all, puppet tricks? I'm now? doing a Venn diagram language? with language? two shadow puppets. Oh, you guys could see the yeah. diagram. <laughs> no. um, so I, so David Milch, who Dude. went to Yale, yeah. who David Milch of Deadwood and, and yeah. um, NYPD Blue, he, from Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm pointing at you guys. I got excited. I upstate New York, yeah. representing the okay. upstate New York. Yeah. Um, David Milch decided he wanted to do a an internship and bring 12 students from Yale out to where he went out to, he wanted to give back out to LA yeah. and I applied I got the internship um and went with a group can we pause real quick there yeah we're now you'd already been out several times to LA just once I had oh, just, just been out till the summer before were the others 11? are you listening I'm I am kidding. listening <laughs> um where do I sign up for body wise um um the other kids was it the first time they were coming out so you already had an experience over them or is this people or is a group you of know what? I don't, it's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't remember. What I do know is that most of the people I was with, at, at in college, um, they had a lot more experience in the world of film. I think they all came from backgrounds where you. They were. They were all smarter than I was, and they were all like. They all were the more of the film people and not the okay. theater people. Okay. okay. Um, but they were all, you know, most of the people who weren't football players were at, at school were pretty smart and um, and usually had connections and usually had, you know, some, they, they usually had a plan of some sort, whereas I was kind of like fly by the seat yeah. of my pants. Um, 
but we came out. He put us up uh, at the Oakwoods on Sepulveda. Oh, I stayed at the Oakwoods yeah. my first time here. Um, and right across from Universal Studios. Oh, no, we were Oakwoods uh, Sepulveda, like in Never Culver mind. City. I never yeah. stayed there. Oh, Glad yeah. we figured that out. Um, and then we would go every day. We'd go to Fox, and we would... Do we would watch episodes of of Brooklyn South, which was his new uh, his his new show that he was working on, um, and then we would analyze scripts and we would talk about the episodes, and then he would lecture on he would give us lectures on 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 writing. Brilliant, brilliant, <laughs> incredibly generous guy, um, and then he would take us to lunch. Like we'd go to lunch at the commissary, and he would take not only us, not only the students, but he also taught a class that were like probably 30 people at lunch every single day. And he would like pick up the tab, just an incredible guy. He would have us over for, to his house for, for barbecues. He would like give us money to go to Las Vegas and put money on horses. Just like what? a guy was in guy, wow. guys, just a, just a really incredible guy. I had a great summer, um, working, working with him. It, I wasn't working. It was literally just like, right. it was just fun and awesome. Um, and then because Steve Perry, was kicked out of the band. They had to bring in this guy from Thailand who apparently was, sorry, where, where was I? Going into your senior year now. <laughs> okay. So now I go back to so senior year. So you won a bunch of money gambling podcast. in Las Vegas. I got it. <laughs> so now we go back to senior year. I had, um, Oh, I forgot to tell you that like during my junior year, my junior year, I, um, I broke my foot against Dartmouth same right? foot, bring, same foot you heard same before? foot, I, the same story I was telling earlier. I just, I'm going, I'm doing a little, uh, yeah. A little um, Pulp Fiction-y. Yeah, memento me- is what I was going to go with, but that's fine. I forgot Memento. Um, <laughs> so I hurt my foot, and I am walking around. I had it reconstructed like three times over my junior year and Jeez. walking around with a, on New Haven with a cast and, and crutches. Um, all right, so anyway, <laughs> I hit a point where I'm like, uh, you know, going into my senior year, and I the coach was like, okay, a new coach comes in. It's no longer. Karm uh, Kaza. It's no longer Carm uh, Coza. This is my. I'm going to do an impression of yeah, my go. college coach that nobody's going to nobody's going to um, appreciate it. Chris Hetherington yeah. watches this podcast. Oh, does he? Yeah. Okay, so this is this one is for Chris. That's a, <laughs> Mike Carm Coza one day during practice. So Carm Coza, legendary Yale uh, football coach. I think he's the second most winning winningest coach. Is that the, how you say it? Winningest. winningest? Yeah, yeah. He has the second most wins of any sure, there you go. college coach. Out. Who You're has, a writer, huh? Who has the? Uh, I, I, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> clearly, I like this guy. <laughs> who, um, who is the? Who holds the record? Who? Just a trivia question for you. I'm not a sports guy. You have to. It ask was this Paterno, guy. but then they took all his wins away. No more than Paterno. Bobby Bowden. No. Football? This is going to be the rest of the podcast. Nick Saban. Nope. No idea. All right, I'm going to leave the you audience. I'm going to leave John you. Denver. That is correct. It is John Denver who has more wins than anybody in the history of college football. Anyway, so Carm Coza uh, retires, and they bring in a new coach, Tom Sidlecki, and I am kind of at the point where I'm like, do I want to play? Like, do I? I come out for practice. It's sort of he's kind of rebuilding my foot. I didn't. I've never really like felt yeah. what I felt before the foot. I'm like, you know what? I, I my senior year. I'm going to go all in on, uh, you know, what I love doing, um, is, is making movies. And kind of just real quick, do you feel like if you hadn't have broken your leg and you were full out, it would have been a harder decision to make or you, yeah, knew, I you would knew. have won. I would have been, I feel like I would have been a first round draft choice, <laughs> um, for cool. most NFL teams. Um, so you lived in a fantasy when you were in, high that is God, correct. That's awesome, yes. man. I love unicorns too. I truthfully, like as a football player, I was a good football player um, for high school. I was an average football player for college. Um, I could have maybe like walked on somewhere and just because of my hustle or and I would have, you know, played one special teams for somewhere. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't have gone pro as a football player. I thought I was going to go pro when I went to college for yeah. sure. I was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to crush everybody here. And then like the six, the second day of practice, I'm like, all right, I'll just start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so it made it easier or a quicker decision than at least. Yeah. Okay. And, and listen, football was so much fun. Like I had a lot of fun, but sure. I also, when I quit playing football, it opened up 
it, right. it opened up my eyes to, to mm. other things that were happening in college. You know, I was going to plays. I was getting, I was part of different groups. I just, I was able to, I was able to sit in this. I was able to tailgate for the first time at the Harvard Yale game. So much fun. Everyone, you know, so much more fun than playing in the game. <laughs> just drinking and watching other people get so hurt. So much more fun. 100%. Um, so where were we? We were drinking and watching people get hurt. You graduate yep. now? So I graduate and I go and I get a job for a creative artist agency. I was an assistant to uh, Mara Jacobs, oh. um, who is a wonderful person. Um, she was, I worked, I worked there answering phone, Mara Jacobs office, hold on, Mara Jacobs office, CAA at the time and uh, was, was the coolest place in the world, represented Steven yeah. Spielberg, Tom Cruise. Uh, it was, it was just incredible. I loved Is she on the lit side or the, or the talent side? She was on the lit side. The lit side, okay. Um, she was on the lit side and I I just loved I loved working there. It was I just suddenly felt like I was I've never heard anyone say that about interning at an agency. You know what people people some people just hate it. Um I suddenly found myself almost like I was back in high school in a way where I um I don't know. It was just, it was surrounded by all these young people who were out there wanting to do the same thing that I was doing. I felt really confident. I was just feeling like really confident. Um, That's great. And it was just amazing to be in the epicenter of, I mean, I was answering phones. I, I once picked up the phone and it was, um, I was like Mary Jacobs office and, um, and the guy on the other line was like, Rick Nasita, please. And I was like, uh, sorry, you have the, the, the wrong, the extension, uh, I could transfer you. May I ask you, may I ask you what's going on? This is Al Pacino. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, oh, hold on one second, uh, Mr. Pacino. And then I, I was like, uh, hey, Tony, um, it's, I've got Al Pacino uh, transferring for Rick. He's like, okay. And I transferred him over. I was like, hoo <laughs> I just felt, uh, I felt, <laughs> it was super cool. I loved working there. I would, I mean, I would show up so early. I would show up super early and I would be writing and you'd get paid at that point. You, at that time you'd be paid, um, overtime you, for you'd come like, they'd see what time you checked in in the morning to see what time you'd leave at night. So I literally would come at like six thirty, seven o'clock and I would get there and I would leave at 11 at night Dang. and I would eat like, they would always have bagels in the conference room. They would always have events. I just, I loved it. You um, hustled straight up. I was, I was always a hustler. Like I was always a hustler. I respect that. I respect that. Um, so I, hmm. they had this thing there called the um, creative, it was called the creative group lunch. By the way, I it needs a better I'm, name, but yeah. I think I may have killed that name. Hold on a <laughs> second. Let me take a sip of my diet. Coke. Sure, sure. Beverly Hills Ninja. It was Creatives. called the Creative Lunch Group. <laughs> what did I say? Creative Group Lunch. The Creative Just Group Lunch. Put the adjective in front. He's yeah, a writer. I, I wanted guys. to change names to protect uh, <laughs> the lunch group. I don't know if they still do it, but um, it basically was all the assistants would have to cover a periodical at the time. So um, for me, I would cover the Wall Street Journal on Thursday. Thursdays and the LA Times on Sundays. And what that meant was I would have to read the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times uh, Thursday and Sundays and see if there was any story that could make a good film or TV show. And so I started doing that and I would basically that became my job. I stopped becoming, I stopped doing assistant. I was a terrible assistant at that point. Um, I used to have uh, all of like, you used to have to take your CC things. Like anytime you submitted a script or did any letter, you would have to CC and you'd have to file all the CCs. I literally never filed anything. I'd like under my desk, like hidden giant piles of like paper of CCs. Um, my boss found them at, at some point. I'll get to that story in a second. <laughs> so the creative lunch happened and I started just coming up with story. It was like, this is my opportunity. You're sitting in a, a room full of uh, assistants in Hollywood, and what they would do is on Friday they would invite a client. They would invite, um, you know, they would invite the, the Farrelly brothers, like any of their clients. Right. They would say, "Hey, come, come, have lunch with us and hear all these ideas." Yeah. Right. So I just started doing it, and I, w I like moved beyond the Wall Street Journal on Thursday. I started just reading 
everything and I would just come up with ideas and I would be like, okay, you know, so-and-so, such and such. My name is Jeremy Garlick and I work for Mara Jacobs and uh, here's the story. So picture it. You're blah, blah, blah. You're doing this. You got a thing. You got a cup and you're, so how do you get here? You're on a podcast and whatever. And it became the thing. And like to the point where like other assistants would look at me to be like, are you pitching today? Well, good job. Like, are you doing like, um, and you only had like a minute or two minutes. Yeah. You'd go around the room and, and um, that was kind of uh, the thing that I would just lean into. And I got to, there was one day where the, the client never showed up. So Kevin Uvain, um showed up instead. Kevin Uvain ran CAA. He was the head of CAA. And I got to my turn and I made a pitch, right? And in the middle of the pitch, kind of at the end of it, he stands up and he's like, okay, I'm going to save Hollywood. You know, just like threw it out there. Like I'm, I'm going to ruin Hollywood or something. And, uh, I'm the next day I, um, I, I'm just like answering the phones, Mary Jacobs office, Mary Jacobs office and Kevin Uvain walks past our office walks past the cubicle and is like, you know, he's just kind of points at me. He's like, Hey, I, I pitched your idea to Madonna, uh, last night. She wants to do it. You're going to pitch it to uh, Kevin McCormick over at Warner brothers. Uh, and just like walks and like keeps walking. <laughs> and I was like, I had been working there like six months and I didn't, I, I didn't understand. And Madonna was massive. She was yeah. a massive star at that point. Um, so I was like, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I went in to I speak to Mara. I'm like, what, what, what does that mean? What, what do I do? And she's like, I don't know. I, I don't know what that means. But she <laughs> called his assistant and he was like, I don't know what that means. Either. Like, all that <laughs> stuff, like, what said. And um, I ended up like, ended up um, getting set up to go pitch to go to Warner Brothers and pitch the studio. And I leave you know, I leave my, I leave at like, I don't know, I leave the desk and I drive over to Warner Brothers and I went in and I pitched to Kevin McCormick and at the end of it, he's like, okay, so are you gonna ride it? Like, what are you, like, are you producing? I'm like, I don't know, I'm an assistant at CAA. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And he said, uh, um, okay, well, who's your agent? And I was like, Kevin Uvain. And he's like, okay, well, let us, uh, let's talk to him and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, I'm like, great. So I went back and they're like, how was it? I was like, I was like, I don't know. I think it went like, well. They, they hired like, me to write the script. <laughs> no, I, I went, no, they didn't. I, I, they, they, I, I had no idea what happened. And I get a call like, like later that day or like the next day. I was like, Mary Jacobs, I'm Mary Jacobs. Uh, I have Kevin Uvain for you. I was like, oh, okay. And, um. He's like, hey, Jeremy, um, okay, so uh, he, they don't want to buy the script, but they want to hire you to, to be a CA. You could think about it. Let me know. Hangs out. And I'm like, huh. By what? A creative executive? To be a, I didn't even know what a CEO yeah, was I'd... at the time. Um, and I <laughs> was like, oh. Are you making this up as you're going along? Yes. This is all I'm making. <laughs> is this real? This. You no, really I'm... did this? That's I... crazy. That's awesome. Um Yes. Next, next, Madonna's going to be your agent. That's great. Congratulations. Madonna, if you're listening, I need a new agent. <laughs> um, so so where was I? CE. Okay, so then I'm like, okay, what's a CE? That's a thing. That's... And I kind of was debating. I was with Jay Lavender and I. Oh, Jay Lavender was uh, my writing partner, but he was also an assistant at, at CA with me. And we're, we were talking and um, it was late that night and Mara had been gone. We were in Mara's office. And Kevin walks by. He's like, oh, what are you guys talking about? I remember him saying, uh, you conspiring to take over the company? And we're like, ah, ah, ah. And he's like, oh, uh, we were just talking about that Warner Brothers thing. He's like, sorry, so what are you thinking? And he, like, can't, 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 comes in and married this, like, candy, like this uh, glass jar of, like, candy and stuff. And he starts, uh, you know, he's like, oh, opens up a little Snickers thing or whatever. And I just was like, I don't know if... It's like, I, I don't know if I want to go down this road. I feel like if I go and do this, I'm going to be the guy who's like going to be wearing a suit for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I would be going down that road. And I just didn't really want to do that. Um, I just don't like suits. I'm uncomfortable in suits. Uh, no. So he's like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to be a director. And he said, well, if you want to be a director, go work for a director. I was like, great. And he's like, we have, you know, we'll hook you up. Just, we'll just, yeah, you go work for a director. So then probably like four or five months later, I get a call and he's like, okay, uh, Jeremy, you're, you're going to go down to, um, to Jacksonville and, uh, go work for Joel Schumacher, who is, um, who's directing a movie called Tigerland. 
Uh, he's like, you should probably leave uh, today. Um, I'm like, great. <laughs> uh, that was so, Colin Farrell's first big like blowout role, right? Yeah, it was Colin's first movie. It was his first movie, and it was my first mo- time on set. Um, in fact, my first assignment, uh, even before Joel got there, um, I beat Joel because I actually had to drive. They, I had to drive my car back uh, from L.A. to to, to Stark, Florida. Um, my first job was to take Colin and Matt Davis yeah. to um, to Miami for the weekend and make sure that they got tan <laughs> uh, because we were we were they were doing a, a photo shoot with Bruce Weber for the cover of Interview for Interview Magazine. And, um, so that was my first job. I had to, to babysit, uh, Colin and we were all the same age. So I had to make sure that they, uh, stayed out of trouble and got tan. That was my first job. And, um, Bo Flynn was a producer of Red Notice, yeah, was yeah. the producer on that movie. He was a young, young guy, um, just kicking ass on that movie. That's crazy. Um, and we made that, we made the movie. I loved working for I, the moment I saw Joel and how he was on set and, I was like, this is what I want to do. And and Joel was so great. Literally on day one, he would turn to me and be like, what do you, th- hi, hon, what do you think? So what do you think, <laughs> hon? Do you like that? Like, And I, I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's great. He's like, you have any, any other, any thoughts or whatever? I was like, well, what if you put the camera behind the target and kind of rack focus to Colin aiming and, and shooting? And he's like, Let's try it. Why don't we just move the camera behind the thing, like do the thing, like and we'll rack focus to Colin was aiming, and I was just like, it was like it, he was so incredible. He used to say, "I don't want any of you going home and telling your spouses or your your your, your friends or whoever you're with um, what I did wrong today." He's like, "Tell me, come. You have an idea if I'm doing something wrong, or if you have an idea to make something wow. better, wow. come up and tell me." don't yell it out in front of everybody while I'm in the middle of something, but like find the right time and come, you know, huh. just whisper it in my ear and we'll wow. try it. Like best, best idea wins. Um, working for Joel was incredible. So the first, I was only hired to go work on that one movie. Right. Wow. So um, I had, uh, I was hired as a local PA to work on that one film. And then I didn't know what I was going to be doing afterwards, but the last night of the shoot, we we're on our way, um, back home, back to the hotel. And, uh, my, my friend who was Joel's assistant at the time, he was his assistant at the time. And, um, he had done like seven movies with Joel at that point. Uh, Eli Richborg, who unfortunately, uh, passed away since then, um, was in the, the, the front seat and I was in the back seat and Joel's driving. For some reason he always drove. He was a terrible driver and I wish he would have let, so I used to like have to just make sure that I was just like praying in the front seat. And, um, while he was driving, he'd be on the phone with his flip phone and be like, ah, <laughs> um, but wait, wait, what was that again? Nah. <laughs> that was just like what he would say while he was driving with his flip phone. Um, but anyway, so we were pulling out, it was like five in the morning, you know, as sun's rising in Stark, Florida. And, I didn't know what I was doing next. I was like going to drive and he's like, okay, so, um, so what do you, what's the plan now? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, okay, so why don't you take a week and, you know, just get yourself sorted and then come back and, um, Eli can show you where your office is. You can maybe take like where Claire's office was and you could take that spot. And, um, and Eli and I like make eye contact where he's like, I guess you're hired, you know? So I ended up, um, working for Joel for, I did four movies with Joel. I did, um, phone booth, phone booth was the second one. I yeah. love that movie. What were also you, what were you doing on that? I was carrying Joel's Evian water. So you were, yeah, you were director in training. Got it. I was literally holding Joel's Evian glass water bottle and I would hold like peanuts and, and bar and I would just make sure that he was hydrated. And Tony and I can do both of those for you on your next movie. Yeah. Just so you know, I, I already have a lot of peanut and water yeah. holders. Just so you know, <sighs> do you I'm have, do you have, Body, what's it body called again? Body yeah, wise. I just do that so you can say it. Okay, go. Um, so uh, phone I, booth. And phone then... booth. Um, phone booth was uh, was incredible. It was an incredible experience. It was also incredible to watch um, Colin go from being this unknown Irish kid who I had to get tan um, in in Miami to when when Tigerland premiered at Toronto. I remember coming into the theater. Nobody knew 
who he nobody like knew who he was when the movie was over the entire theater like just would just mobbed him wow. and i watched it was just one of those incredible he was three seats down for me and i just it was one of those experiences where i was like i just watched a m- movie star get made. Get yeah it was incredible it was just an incredible moment um and yeah, so now so and you was, helped with the tan. So I did. Some of that's your I don't think contribution. he would be the the star he is today if he I did know not he get tan. I know in, he um, would not in be known. Um, I don't even honestly. I don't even know if he got tan. I don't even know if he. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even. I'll have to ask. Her. I don't even remember. Like I don't remember ever being like sitting outside and like actively trying right. to get tan. I don't remember that at all. Um, I have literally have no recollection. So after you do four movies with Joel, are you ready to? Well, so I'm writing the entire oh, okay, time. Okay, okay. So the whole time I'm writing, I'm writing on, I'm writing on. Are you working on the Golden Tux at this point? I am. I'm working on the Golden Tux, but I'm also working on other things. I'm working on, I'm working on the Joel movies. I did the movie Bad Company with Chris Rock and Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With Jerry Bruckheimer. I'm like doing, Eli and I are like constantly rewriting on set. We're rewriting while we're making that movie. We did a movie called Veronica Guerin with Kate Blanchett, also yep. uh, Jerry Bruckheimer. We're working on that. We're working on pages. Um, when you're, you know what it is like when you're on set and there's rewrites that are needed, like nobody, like ever, whoever can do it is just, and we were just people who can like do it and know how to, like we knew the, the code for the printer. So we right. were able to like print out pages. So those were the pages that we were shooting. Um, just the little things. <laughs> so, um, I was writing the whole time. Um, I was, I, I wrote a script called the snow toilet, um, classic. I wrote, um. I wrote uh, a script called Burning Your Feet. Um, and then I had hooked up with Jay Lavender, who was my assist, who was, who we were assistants together at, uh, in, at CAA. Yeah, yeah. And I had pitched him this idea that I was working on, which was uh, w- what if there's a professional best man? Like, imagine Vince Vaughn is your professional best man. He loved it. And the two of us started, uh, we started working on it together. I was in Ireland and he was in LA and we were kind of sending stuff back and forth. He actually um, flew over to Ireland while I was shooting, I was directing second unit for Joel. Um, so if you see, I don't know if you guys have seen um, Veronica Guerin with Kate Blanchett. Not. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. <clears throat> I don't think anyone has except for my mom. <laughs> um, but if you do, you'll see like some really cool shots of like fingers on on keyboards. Um, and that was you. And also, uh, there's a great shot of blood being like when she gets shot. Or pff, shit, spoiler. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, you see blood getting splattered on a window in a car. That was all me. Wow. Um, Se- so, second unit. Second unit. Uh, so Eli and I did second unit together, and I was, I was somewhere in, um, I was, I was coming home on a bus, somewhere in Ireland, like coming back to the city from. God knows right. what, where, and I got a call on my cell phone, and it was like, uh, I was like, hello, and I'm like, hey, uh, this is Mike Shoresky and Ramses Ishak from uh, William Morris Agency. We read your script, and we really want to, we, we really love it. I was like, uh, hello, hello. Suddenly, like, I hung up on them, I and I didn't remember who, what they said, their name. They said it that fast. Do you guys remember what I just said? And Mike I heard. Okay, so if you if you guys were in that situation, you guys are writers, you're, you're doing stuff like you guys are in that situation. What would you do at that point? Your phone's not ringing again. Yeah, call William Morris. No idea. Yeah, so that's what I did. I called William Morris, yeah. but I didn't know the names. Right. Of, can it's you repeat not... the? What would you say to you know? Hi, this is William Morris. How can I help you? I just got a call. I just got a call from Mike uh, Shalecki, and uh, they said they liked my script. Can you connect me? I don't know. That's what I said. I, yeah. I wasn't Shalecki. I said Shashevsky, <laughs> like who's the Duke coach. And <laughs> um, so they fi- finally figured it out. They they put me in touch with them, and um, they said if you can't, if you sign, they were basically like, you come, we'd love to meet with you. We'd love to sign you. Um, I had at that point, I'm kind of skipping over stuff, but I had, uh, I got Bell's palsy. You guys know what that is? Yeah. Um, it was Stallone kind of has. I had like my the side of my face went paralyzed, Part, yeah. and um, I was I was directing to unit. I wasn't sleep. I was going home. I was writing. Is was, that is that a stress a fatigue thing usually with lack of sleep and pressure, and it just kind of your body shuts down? Yeah, it was it was more yes that led to kind of my immune system. Like I just right. might crushed my immune system, um, so a virus kind of took yeah, over. Yeah. Um, and I was directing, and my and I, I my my uh, first AD was like. 
Fuck some matter to your face, mate. <laughs> That was Colin Farrell, by the way. <laughs> no, Colin was not on second. You actually, Colin was in Veronica Guerin. He did. A, he does a cameo in Veronica Guerin. I forgot. It's about his hands that. typing. That's amazing. It is Colin's hands typing. Um, I didn't realize, but like my face, I was working so like I was working level ten, and my face yeah. was like, I didn't realize like I couldn't close my eye. My 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 mouth was like, clo- I couldn't yeah. close on one side. Dang. And he's like, you got, he wouldn't let me, my first AD, he was super responsible. He's like, I, he wouldn't let me, he's like, you have to go to like the hospital. So yeah, yeah. I said, sure. And I'm like, I, I, I'm an athlete. I'm a football player. I was just like, oh, I don't care. Who cares? We'll just, let's finish the day. Like it's, it's my like, face. It's just my it's face. It's not my ankle. It's I my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do I need my face for? This is like, <laughs> um, I remember Joel being really scared. I remember him just saying, like, um, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, hon. Oh my gosh. Like, and he, he like made sure to get me on the phone with, you know, the top doctors in New York and LA. And I, and so I said to, um, I said to, to Mike Krzyzewski, <laughs> Mike Krzyzewski, I was like, I, I would love to take a meeting. I just, I need some, I need a minute to just get my health in order. Yeah. I mean, I was wearing an eye patch. I was like drinking out of a straw. Um, oh, I was serious then. Yeah, at that point, it, it was pretty serious. I, like it was serious for everybody else. Right. For me, the only thing, honestly, like the only thing that really bothered me during the entire time is I couldn't tell a story. I couldn't like say anything or have a conversation with anybody without anybody. Like just the only thing they were focused on was what face, my yeah. face looked yeah. like, and it really it gave me a lot of. Um, empathy and understanding for with people who have any sort of deformities and Mm -hmm. um how challenging it is and i really try to um whenever i'm with somebody or speaking to somebody who has a deformity Mm -hmm. i try so hard to not like i just having been on the other side i try so hard to not let that get in the way of me focusing um no matter how difficult it is um so i go to uh i go to meet at william morris uh, with Jay Lavender, and they're like, if you sign with us, we'll sell this tomorrow. What script is it? It was called The Golden Touch. Okay. Um, Which so became Jay... for the audience. Are you going to give it away already? No, not yet. Right, I'm, just, it's, 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 I'm just a setup yeah. right there. Yeah. I'm oh, just kidding. Cool. No, that did, I was um... setting you up for the for the spike. Oh, man. Should we come back to it? I can tell you. We can, Let's do we it can... again. Take two. No, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> but we met. They said, we'll sell it. To, we could sell this tomorrow. Um, and they had. They, we were like, okay, we'll sign with you guys. That sounds like a good thing. They had given it to three directors who they represented. One of them were, was Todd Phillips, who, who read it, um, and he gave it to the Weinsteins. He had a deal with Bob Weinstein at the time. Um, and they basically were like, here's a check, right? We're going to take this offer off the table in an hour. You decide. It was more money than I like I had ever thought, like, thought I would make in my life it was just I was making like four hundred dollars for a week for working for Joel um and I so my agents were like listen you have no like we have no idea we might be able to sell this for a million dollars we might be able to sell it for for two million dollars we don't know but you have an offer on the table it's a good offer you could take it or and Jay and I were just like let's just do it let's let's take it so we sold the script. Um, suddenly, I'm a professional writer, um, and we wrote it for Vince Vaughn. And we met with Vince. Vince loved the script. Um, we met Vince, and suddenly, like, it was the coolest. It's like, oh my gosh, Vince Vaughn, who, who, when when I was in college, I saw Swingers. Right. And yeah. um, that was the movie when I was in college where I was like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. Because it just looked like what I did. Yeah. Just two guys walking around with a camera. Um, and Vince came in, loved the script, wanted to do it. And at the time, the Weinsteins didn't want to do it with Vince. They had they had made a they had done made with him, and they oh, yeah. like I didn't know if it was the numbers or they just if, for whatever reason they didn't want to do it with Vince. And it kind of we didn't want to move past Vince, so it kind of just killed the movie at that point. Gotcha. Um, Vince said, "I want you guys to do like, what do you think? I want to, I have another idea for a movie um, about a couple that breaks up, and I want it to be like the anti romantic comedy." What do you think? And we both wanted him to do the other movie, so we were just like, yeah, we love it. We love the movie. Um, so we, I actually started dating my now wife. Um, I started dating um, Samantha, and she was living in New York. I ended up just kind of 
go into New York and bring my computer and just started writing. I didn't know what I was writing, but we we would get into fights. Like I would pick fights with her and then I would like just, that's I was like, good. okay, that's good. And I'd go in the other room and I'd just write down the fight. And it just, I, that movie became the breakup. Um, yeah. but so she would be like, my sister's been through a lot. Of dick. You went in the next yeah. room and write yeah. of dick. Yeah, she doesn't so, have a sister. She has a brother <laughs> and he's been through a lot. Dave, if you're listening to this. <laughs> Um, Dave is, uh, Dave, my, my, I have two brother-in-laws, um, uh, my, my, um, uh, my wife's brother, Dave, um, and, uh, my, my sister's ex-husband, um, but at the time when the hangover came out and we could talk, it, they're like, the, they both were like the brother-in-laws, uh, not based on, both of them came on my bachelor party. And they're like, the brother-in-law is uh, not based on me. It's based on the other guy, the other brother-in-law. Right? Right. I'm like, yeah, of course, it's not based on you. Uh, <laughs> so real, back up real quick. So for the audience, so you sold the Golden Tux, you and J- Jay, Yeah, right? Jay Lavender. So is Vince Vaughn's production company paying you to write no, the second? Are you no. Just, you're so writing it on spec. We're writing it on spec. Okay, okay. We don't know. We're just like, I thought yeah. you got two checks, and I'm like, wow, that's congratulations. No, no, we're writing it on spec. Um, we're writing it on spec, and... We don't know. Vince Vaughn's like, yeah, I got an hey, idea. I write this thing for, and I'm like, yeah, of course we're gonna do it. Now right. we're definitely like, it took a lot. Lo- it took a lot out. You you took a lot out of um, us, and you, I, it, well, I sold. We we sold our our script for, I think we sold it for three hundred thousand okay. dollars. Right, massive. Now, let's do some math. Right, you. I have a partner. Yep, right. one one fifty off okay. the bat. I've got an agent. Yeah, ten percent, fifteen percent. You made like seventy grand. Okay, I've got a manager. Yeah, so there's I've got a lawyer. Right Taxes. So lawyer. Forty percent out of that. R- Writers Guild. Yeah. Forty percent is what you're taking home now, probably. Okay, so now you're only paid. Com- you're like there are steps that are broken up, so you're paid commencement of like the rewrite, delivery of the rewrite, mm-hmm. commence. So you're pl- paid in steps. So you. What sounds like it's a tremendous amount of money suddenly, that that kind of like goes away pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You would you get thirty five, forty thousand off of that when you're all done? Honestly, I, I don't. Re- honestly, yeah. I don't really remember. Um, but I remember. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot as much. As yeah. Know. No, I definitely remember. Kind of, I hit. A, there was a thing where like when I came out to, I came out to a lot of people do this where they're like, oh. If you know, I'm on the five year plan. It's like if I don't make it after five years, I'm gonna go do my plan B. It, when I hit, I remember like hitting five years, and I was like, I kind of made, made it, it yeah, but yeah. I have no money, and I'm like, I don't know. Like, I didn't either make it or or it didn't make it. You um, got Vince now, though. I got Vince. Jay and I were struggling. Jay and I, like, as a you know, writing as a writing partner, um, it's writing having a writing partner, as you guys know, doing anything creative with yep. someone, um someone who you like and who, who's a, a friend, it's always challenging. And we were kind of going through some hard, like we were going yeah. through some challenging times. And I remember, um, I remember I did a draft first and then he went and did a draft that was totally different. And then we were like, got a call from Vince. He's like, where's the draft? And I remember Jay being like, Oh, we can get it to you like by Friday. And, and I was like, wait, what? What, what do we do? And we ended up getting together like in a room with Alan Fisher, who was our manager at the time. Um, and just try, we basically did a cut and paste version of both of our drafts and we turned it in. I remember driving down to, um, to Brandon Jacoby's, uh, yeah. another Beverly Hills, Hills Ninja, 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 Ninja uh, yeah. defensive player of the year, several, t- several yeah. years in a row. Um, we're driving down to his wedding in San Diego. And I remember saying to my wife, like, I'm, done like this is it like we sent this into Vince and I'm like this script's not gonna like this is the end of my career like I got let's I'm just gonna have fun this weekend and we'll figure out whatever the next thing we're gonna do and then I like Saturday morning I remember waking up and just checking my voicemail and I had a it's like yo buddy it's Vince uh um I just read the script like incredible job like this is uh I mean it was just and he starts going I love the scene with this and he starts going through it like and literally like a 30 minute message from Vince just being so. Why don't you come by? Why don't you come by uh, the house on? Just come bring your computer. Let's let's get the let's roll up our sleeves. Why don't you come by the house on uh, on Monday when you Jay get come by, and um, we'll get into it. So I remember just like driving up there, um, 
Jay coming in a different car and Jay and I were not like at the time, like at that moment we were just weren't doing great together. And I remember we both like got out of the car and he's holding a printer and I've got like all this paper and like, I've got like, we both have our computers and we both like, I, we both look at each other in the eye with like a smile, like, okay, like here we go. Yeah. And we, uh, we moved into Vince's house and we sat like we, Jay and I basically, worked with Vince and did a new draft of the script with Vince. Um, and we were there for a long time um, to the point where I would, you know, I would have to like hide in the closet to pick up the phone from Sam. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm at Vince's. I can't talk. We're in the middle of a brainstorm session. Like I gotta go. I'll talk to you later. Um, so, so yeah, so we ended up uh, we finished the script. We had a You say that's a three month process probably? I'm so bad with time. Ah, so no it's worries. either three months or like twelve years. Okay. I don't I don't really know. We'll go with twelve years. Um but we <laughs> really dedicated. I got that. I like that. <laughs> we have a we finish the script and then we have just like people we know, like our, our my sister, like a couple of people we invite over just to read it out loud and we read it out loud and people are giving feedback and in, in their notes and um but we everyone felt like pretty good about it. everyone's like feeling pretty good about the script um so then we went out with it we gave it to uh we went out with it with vince and i think wedding crashers had just come out and he was a huge star at yep. the time um and we ended up just selling the movie the spec for a huge amount of money um and we were going, it was, we had Jennifer Aniston and we were co-producers on it. And we, um, was that a bone that Vince threw you guys or like, how'd you get producer credit? I had been a producer. So I had having worked with Joel, I was an associate. I was, okay. a, I was a, an associate producer on the last two Joel movies. Um, so I had precedent. Um, and then I don't know, I think it was just, we had a, we were just, we were, we just had many, yeah. studios who were, were bidding for it so we were kind of had the leverage to do whatever we wanted right. Right. um i do remember um we got a call from scott stuber who was the head of universal at the time and he was the only it was really kind of a, an amazing lesson scott stuber called jay and i everyone was calling vince right and saying like oh vince we love the script we love it we want you to do it with us all that stuff That's right awesome. scott stuber calls us it's the only studio person who calls us and just be, tell us how great how much he loved the script um how much he loved the ending and we just were like that's so cool that this guy yeah. called us um uh so where are we <laughs> where were we you're in chicago you're um shooting the breakup you are we're got, shooting the breakup you got engaged to your wife i not yeah right after that shout out to engaged. samantha thank shout you for letting samantha. uh him come out of the house for a few hours to uh talk with us she kicked me out yeah <laughs> Um, she loves me though, so she does. She does. Um, we, uh, yeah. Can we talk about that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to. Um, yeah. So we were in Chicago. Movie. We shot the movie. It was all. It was an incredible experience. Um, I was on set. You know, just I, I actually directed the opening sequence, uh, the montage of their history, the oh, relationship, really? which was actually uh, the reason I was asked to direct it was because I. Um, I did it with Sam, with Samantha and I, I had created a montage. I did, I kind of was doing selfies before selfies was a thing. Yeah. Um, and I had created this montage and I kind of pitched it during the script writing process as like a way to just show their history. Show their history yeah. So that in a very quick way during, um, and then at some point nobody was really like, they were like, Oh, we'll get this later. We'll like deal with this sort of montage later. And it wasn't, built into the schedule it wasn't done and i remember just vince turning to me be like you just do you just just do it just do this just do it and i was kind of called in from the bullpen to have some sort of responsibility on set otherwise i was just for the most part just like eating craft services and just <laughs> hanging out um and i i just would i directed and produced with no schedule or no no budget um the opening montage which are just stills based yeah. based on my montage with with sam um when, which was great which was incredible so yeah. i got the opportunity to to direct uh vince and and jennifer at, at that point what i know you're doing second unit directing what was the last second unit and then you picked up obviously as director at some point what what was that 
in in terms of what was the two projects like the last thing you did second unit on and then the first thing you directed on well the last thing i did second unit on was veronica garen um in in ireland um and then on this i was just a i was a writer and i was a, a co-producer on this movie the breakup and just there kind of learning as as much as i could right um and got the opportunity to direct as oh peyton reed uh directed the movie did a wonderful job but just when you're when you're doing a movie like this and it's kind of crazy and just things like there's certain things that are kind of menial and they're overlooked and they're like oh we'll deal with this sort of right. thing like later this is kind of going to be problematic it's outside of our budget and um but for me i was sort of handed this challenge and i was like i'm going to crush this thing um which i did i, I did a really good job i i um i just managed to to were those all set in. photos they were all photos okay. that i just basically got you know i would make i would design a set that was in the set we would have like you know we would have a christmas tree and we're right. like okay let's have this set be ready and i would make sure to just have vince and jen like in, they wouldn't go back to the trailer I'd be like come over here here put this on and go, go. so it was um it was kind of like indie filmmaking mm -hmm. while we were doing it yeah um and I was really grateful to to Peyton, who, who uh, trusted me with uh, with that. Um, Peyton made a made a great movie, and the movie came out was a was a, a big hit. Um, and then does that get you more jobs? Be and also backing up a little bit, was that the last script you and Jay wrote together? That was the last script because it was so challenging. Well, no, I think um, <clears throat> we did a couple of other scripts after that. I think we did a couple of other scripts right after that, um, but that was the last one that was made that we got it. Um, while I was so after the the breakup. By the way, I might be making some of this up because I'm, I'm. We hope my that you are. Yeah. A little foggy, yeah. um, but after the breakup, I got a call from Todd Phillips, mm. who was at Koi uh, just recently, recently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> several months ago. And Todd said, well, let's meet for, I guess he had just signed a deal with Warner Brothers. And he said, um, let's, let's meet for lunch, just talk about some stuff. And um, he wanted to do a, he wanted to do a TV show that was like 24, right? He, okay. I remember he was like, I want to do a TV show that's like a comedic 24. Huh. Um, huh. And... He's just like it's just a like one guy having a but like a one guy just having a bad day, but it's all like in real time. Twenty four meets Kirby enthusiasm. I guess that would be it. But I immediately, um, I was like, I have the idea. I was like, let me just pitch you what this is because it was something that I had thought of yeah. a while ago. I said, do you remember? Um, do you remember that show to catch a predator? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so imagine that Zach Galifianakis, his car breaks down outside of um, a house and goes to knock on the, the door of the house of the To Catch a Predator house one minute before the actual To Catch a Predator guy shows up. <laughs> and immediately he was like, let's do this, let's do this, I gotta do it, gotta do it. Um, so he pitched it to somebody at Warner Brothers and suddenly we're the two of us are writing this script. And we're in the middle of writing this script and he calls me, he said, I, you know, there's a spec, he's like, hey, can we just put a pause on on this because there's a spec script that um, I just read that I really like the idea, but I'd love for you to come in and the two of, let's just get together and we're gonna rewrite it. And, um, and I'm like, yeah, of course, just send it to me. So I read the script, it's called The Hangover uh, by, by uh, uh, John Lucas and Scott Moore, they, they sent, and um, I said, yeah, this is, this will be fun, let's like, a great idea. So I went to, so Todd and I went, I went over to Todd's house. Um, I guess we had set it up at, uh, we set it up at Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, Todd was going to direct it. And we just got in a room together and just with a recorder and we just started riffing. And we just, we met for like, I think we met for like two or three days straight. And literally just riffed out the entire movie on it's all recorded i have it somewhere um and went i went back and then we just did a pass of the script and that became that became the angular um and 
When you say riffing, you guys are throwing out jokes or scenarios or like, would it be funny? Literally if, everything. Would it be funny we're if like, Stu did this? Or, 100%. Yeah. We're like, what if this happens? What yeah. if a guy like comes out? Like the original out, script, was his tooth missing? Basic? Like all that stuff, was that in there? Was what? Like the tooth missing? Like mm. all that stuff, was that in there? I don't remember if the tooth was okay. missed, but the, there was a lot of stuff that was not in the original right. script. But that, you're laying out the basic treatment and structure and the bones of what you're going to basically Yeah, we had out. to figure out how like the story made sense. How, like how we had to like figure out how it all came together. Like, what happened but also what started with like oh, okay what if uh suddenly wake up and there's a tiger and suddenly like there's a baby and there's a thing like we yeah. were just and we would riff out we would basically like riff out all this stuff what if he's like he cuts some hand you know, um and that movie just that be, movie became a, a big hit um and all, because i because everyone had read the original draft right of that script like the original spec script that didn't sell um I suddenly started getting a lot of opportunities because they read, they saw the movie, they read the, the new draft, the script, and they read the old. So I, I started getting a lot of opportunities, including I get a call to see if I wanted to direct the Golden Tux um, with Kevin Hart and Josh Gad. And I said, sure. That was the first movie. Like, of course I would like to do that. And we did a table read. Was that Kevin's first big movie? He had done, uh, for Screen Gems, he had done um, about last night, I want to say about last night, and um, Think Like a Man. Okay, 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 okay. I think he had done, yeah. like, Think Like a Man, and, a, and they were both in the can, so I, I think that... Um, I think I read that it was his first R-rated comedy or something. Is that not... You know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he, like, I know that the people who were seeing all the stuff that he was doing were like, okay, we got to just do something this guy's yeah. a star yeah. Yeah. um so we had a table read um clint culpepper uh who who ran screen gems who was just amazing um very much like very similar to joel in many many ways i i, I um i i love clint um even though there were a lot of uh he, he was an odd he is an odd dude um but awesome um he he we did a table read and I remember, I think Kevin was reading it for the first, I think we were doing a table read so that Kevin could read the script. I think he was reading it for the first, first time, time with everybody. Um, and the table read just crushed. And um, I went and directed that movie. And the movie did really well. Is the Golden Tusk the exact, is it like verbatim, The Wedding Ringer? Just a different so title? So I had, I had written, oh, Coming back to where we said, so this was the Golden Tux, but we had to change the name because apparently through, uh, it was be, to be, I, I think Clint said it sounds like something you do in the shower on somebody. Um, I think some version of that. Wow, okay. um, so we called it the Wedding Ringer. And uh, and um, yeah, where 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 was I? So, the table read, everyone they crushed. Yeah, so when we I, I went it. and made this movie and I had been I felt like I had been preparing to direct for a long time at this point. Um I was I knew this movie backwards and forwards. Was it different than the original Golden Tux? It's funny, I keep getting a question of like I get the question a lot, how did you change the script for you know, something you wrote for, for Vince Vaughn right. to become Kevin Hart. Like, did you have to do a major rewrite for Kevin? And I think it was written, um, the introduction to, to the Jimmy Callahan, is it like Jimmy Callahan, um, tall and handsome steps into the room. And I, and I think I just crossed out tall. I, I think it was <laughs> like Jimmy Callahan, handsome yeah. steps into the room or something along those lines. Um, I know you said you're not good with dates, but from the time you kind of had a finished golden tux to, Okay, we're gonna make the wedding ringer. What you'd been sitting on that script obviously for a while and doing other stuff. Years. How, how long? I, I was think that a it decade? was. I think it was a decade. It was probably a Ten decade. Years, yeah. yeah, it was probably around a decade. Wow. And it was one of those things where it's just like, you know, I, I never, I never in my life have ever finished a project and and something bad happened or went away. I never ever was like, oh, this thing's dead. I'm always just like, oh, it's sleeping for a little while. Okay. You know, it, like one day it'll come back. I, you know, this this, I, this is a project I love. Like one day it'll come back. Um, and yeah, so movie comes out or it doesn't come out yet. It's like in the can. It's testing through the roof. It's it's like the highest, the highest testing like r-rated movie yeah. Sony, sony's ever had um and i was approached by clinton like what do you okay what's next what are we doing next what's the next movie and i said um 
there was a script that I wanted to do and I gave it to him and he read it and he's like, I can't do this, this movie. It's like, I'm like, why? He's like, it's an R rated high school movie. I can't sell this to the studio. I can't, I can't make a high school movie. And I said, but did you like, see American Pie? Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, this is, this is sort of, this is probably 10 years, 15 years after American Pie yeah. and Superbad and yeah. all those, okay. those, those movies, um, where the studios just weren't making any of these films. So I said, but I don't understand. Like, I, you know, these are the movies we grew up on Ferris Bueller, Breakfast Club, yeah. American Pie. It's high school. It's, it's what everybody. Fast times at Richmond High. Fast like times at Richmond cool. High. Like, High school is like the greatest time in the world, and it's just uh, this this time of first. It's the time that like you first figure out who you are, and you you discover your parents aren't perfect. You learn how to drive. You learn you know you you taste alcohol for the first time. You're discovering the music you like. You're just it's just that you fall in yeah. love. You think you're you're you know you think the person you fall in love with in high school like your life will end if you she says no or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I just I just love high school, and he just said to me, he said, um, I you know what I I the problem is that if you I said I can make this thing for five million dollars. He's like it doesn't matter. It still cost ten twenty million dollars to to market. We still have to put it out into the world. So twenty you know twenty five million dollars. If that movie is a home run, if it crushes. Let's just say it makes seventy-five million dollars. Again, let's do. I'm going to count on you guys for the math. Yeah. But seventy-five minus twenty-five, fifty, fifty million dollars, right? In the time when they were making Spider-Man and right. spending five hundred million dollars to make two billion dollars, with the same amount of effort and bandwidth from the studio. So if you're the studio, your businessman in the studio, which movie you're gonna you're gonna get behind, yeah. right? Now that's saying like this movie's gonna crush. Right. And I was like, OK, I understand. And then I remember him coming back um, and saying, like, he came back like the next day. He's like, listen, I um, I believe in you as a filmmaker. And if you want to do an R rated high school movie, like I'll fight. Let's do it. Like I'll, I'll fight. I'll fight for it. I'll fight for you and I'll fight for what you want. And I was like, that's amazing. Like, I, I, it's really incredible. Um, he's like, but I don't want to do this script. He's like, I want to do this other script. And I was like, what? And he gives me this other script, and I start reading the other script. To get home, I start reading the other script, and you, you, it was one of those scripts where I was like, I open it up, and on like page two, I was like, this is going to be a long 120 page. Yeah. And I'm not a good reader to begin with, um, but I fought through it, and I just the next day I was like, listen, I, I didn't, I don't fully understand, I don't get it, but I, in my mind, I was like, all the sets are the same it's all it, like all the the it's a hallway it's a classroom it's a gym it's a locker room it's a it's a bowling alley it's a diner i was like why don't we just sh i'll tell you what why don't we shoot both back to back it's like let me shoot uh, like i'll shoot this one hmm. and then i'll shoot this we'll shoot them back to back so we can save money same locations everything i remember him getting up and like walking away like this is crazy and i had this epiphany i was just like wait a second i wonder how much money one could save if you were to take two films that were high school and you shoot them together. You, you cross shoot them or you shoot them back to back, same crew, same space, mm -hmm. same location. And I ran it by a production guy and he said, you could probably save about roughly a third of your production costs by yeah. doing that. And I'm like, well, okay, for shits and giggles, what if you did three? And basically it was less than, it was, it was just about, Ha like half the money you could you could do it for half the co yeah. your production cost and that's when i was just like okay okay so what if i controlled the space like what if i owned a high school and we shot three high school movies back to back to back how much could we save in doing this hmm. ran the numbers and it was just um you know it was just clear that i could save a lot. i could make a $25 million movie for, you know, $8 million. Um, then I was like, okay, I get it. I understand what the business model is here. Let's find a high school that looks great. That's for sale in a tax incentive area. So I just literally started, I, I looked up where the tax incentive were and I started Googling high schools for sale. Mm -hmm. And I was looking, I kind of got sucked into a, a little bit of a wormhole of, uh, of, um, 
you know, of, of just real estate and, um, and things that are going on in our, our country and, um, areas that are just dying and, um, just really sad. Um, but I came across a high school that was in Liverpool, New York, that was for sale and the tax incentive up there was pretty incredible. And I called, um, I called them just to see, um, you know, I just asked some questions and then Will Phelps, um, who was my assistant at the time and, and I, we got on a red eye, we flew to Syracuse, um, which is right where, uh, which is 20 minutes, um, outside of, of Liverpool. Of Liverpool. Yep. And we walked into the high school and I was just like this, it was, it felt like that moment of, from like, um, like from Bugsy where he's like in the desert peeing and like looks at the desert. It's like, this is it. This is it. Yeah. Like Las Vegas. Like I, I it kind of had that. Flamingo is going to be. That's literally like how I felt. I f- literally, w- I, I landed and I just was staring at the school and I had this vision of what this is going to be. And I knew that that's where I was going to set up shop. And um, we we bought the high school. Um, we partnered with uh with mickey liddell at, um at ld entertainment and he was just incredible he said i trust you i you know go start making movies and he started writing checks and we started making movies we made five five films um back to back to back back to back to back to back to back that's a lot of uh, juice for the squeeze well done Yes, a lot of juice um, for the squeeze. And uh, was this predicated on that you were gonna either write the scripts or direct any of these, like the business model? Was that no? It was oh, okay. more just I was oversee. It Got was it. more like I, I would be, it'd be a kind of a showrunner model, like Got a it. TV model, Got and it. I'd oversee it all. Um, we did a, a film called Big Time Adolescence with Pete, Pete Davidson. Davidson. Yeah, uh, Jason yeah, Orley yeah. wrote the script and directed it, and. Um, that did really. That w- went to Sundance. That did really well. Got the attention of Hulu. Hulu ended up buying that script, um, buying that movie, and um, we made a deal with Hulu to do eight films. Um, so we just started just going boom, 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 and we've made we've made eight, I guess eight films after the five with Hulu, um, and. We've also done films outside of Hulu. Uh, we did. We've we've done probably four or five outside of Hulu. Mm-hmm. So we've just been kind of uh, just making movies left and right up there. It's, Can it's I just ask? Awesome. Um, I know it, it's probably not consistent across the board, but what is that? Four per year? Five per year? Um, You're doing them back to back? Yeah, there. We've we've been averaging about four per year, and we got a little bit screwed. We we'd be up close to six per year if it COVID. wasn't for COVID. COVID. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, but Dang. we actually, we, um, I'm really proud of like during COVID, yeah. we, we were shooting a movie called plan B and we were ready to go when COVID started. And, um, we, we, we ended up having to shut down. We had the entire crew was there and, um, COVID was happening and there was a, a couple that was making these masks. They were doing 3d printing masks and they lived right in like three houses down from where our school was. And I read an article in a local paper and I just called them. I'm like, listen, is there anything we can do to help? Like we're, you know, we've a got full a full team. We've got a full team yeah. of very smart, very capable people. We have a space we've got like, and everyone's kind of just sitting on their asses right now waiting for something to do. And they're like, yeah, we could use a, space we could use a system we could use so we ended up um this this amazing couple who they were printing i think like six or seven masks a day uh, or you know from from their 3d printer we ended up printing close to close to thirty thousand masks over the course of like um, like three three weeks to a month and distributing to every hospital police station so it was um it was pretty incredible what we were able to accomplish during covid in fact it really helped us because when it was time to come back into shooting, we were all, we were really prepped because we were yeah. really working you as a team. never take time off. You were already We didn't shape. really take that much time off. And um, Will, kind of Will, my partner, Will, my assistant at the time, but now he's my partner, um, he kind of wrote the rule. Like he was kind of one of, he took kind of from all the different unions thing. He, he basically kind of wrote the production handbook on COVID. Um, and we came back and we shot, um, we were able to shoot a couple of days of reshoots on a movie called the ultimate playlist of noise. And we were the first production back, like across the board, we were the first production back. Uh, and we really did it as kind of a proof what we had to shoot to finish the movie, but we also did it as a proof of, we can do this. And I remember, um, we have, uh, we had a grip 
and I was I took a I was videotaping everybody just to like just to kind of see it was kind of just a moment in time and I said How, how's shooting in COVID he's like like we're filmmakers our job every single day is to come to work and figure out how to solve a problem they're like so what's the problem we have to we have to wear a mask and we have to stand six feet from each other and somebody has to hand us our food he's like who cares let's move on you know he's like yeah. let's go and I was like it, it hit me at that moment where I was like yeah how great like what yeah. a great attitude um so anyway we um we got back to work and um and yeah we've been been really working a lot so since because then. of your creative group lunches you read an article and that's what got you guys work at American High every day so the creative group lunches is I know you're you're, you're joking it's a very funny joke Tony um <laughs> I didn't think it was funny it was it was funny it was funny we're, we're it was it was a funny yeah. uh, nice. nice um because of the creative group lunches I learned and I was taught to read articles yeah um and and pay attention to anything which could be a story uh, for for what could be a movie or a character, and that really trained my my thinking. And I do it literally six times a day. I'll be I'll be scrolling through through articles on things. I don't read the article. I just read the headlines. Right, right, right. right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we know you're a slow reader. You much. said that, yeah. I'm a fast headline reader. Um, so anyway, where so now I'm here. What else? So Murder a, mystery. Yeah, so it's a, so American High is now a full fledged production company. You guys are shooting stuff. I don't know monthly, weekly. Like, what do we? We're always it? we're basically always. pretty much always shooting stuff. Is we're, it just American High stuff, or can people rent out that that space and bring a production to you? You can. We've we've done a couple um, where people are renting a space, or or we're kind of um, co producing something okay. that other people are financing, yeah. or we'll bring in financing outside of outside of Hulu. But our main it's mainly for us. Yeah. Um, and, and for our films. And how is it translated in like the community of like people like loving you guys being up there and bringing film to like, I think upstate so. New York? it's been kind of, um, it's been kind of amazing in terms of what we as a company have done for the local economy. Um, we actually had to start a, we actually had to start a school cause when, once I bought the building and I was ready to go there we got a call where they're like you're you're in the village of liverpool you can't do this there's like a mayor and a board and you're just not zoned for commercial use and i was like excuse me what's that <laughs> i just bought the school yeah i think i, I like, just wrote a check yeah why didn't you tell me that a month ago um but i basically had to go and like do a meeting where they told me i couldn't do it because we're not it's not zoned for commercial use it's only zoned for a school and i'm like well we're a school and they were like excuse me i'm like yeah we're a film school uh where oh. we teach film and they're like you are i'm like yeah that was part of our entire intention the entire time is yeah. is is where like our dream was to open a film school everybody knows that and they're like well you have to you know you have to prove to you know, you have to prove that you are a film school. You have to get accreditation. You have to do all this stuff. So we ended up, we're like, okay, no problem. So then we ended up going around to every university. We went to Syracuse University, Ithaca, Lemoyne, Onondaga Community. We went around and we pitched our this whole thing. And we ended up forming partnerships with all the local universities where students and universities could come and work on our movies and take and, and learn what what they're doing in film and get credit for get school credit. So we ended up actually starting this school and just because we had to. But what we realized was that there was no real crew up there. And suddenly, like after three or four, you know, we had an intern on our first movie. We had like six interns on our first movie who'd never been on a film before. And then we hired four of them on the next movie as PAs in different departments. And those PAs like worked themselves up eventually, like they were running departments. And then but as we were going, now it's five years down the road, six years down the road. Mm -hmm. We've had hundreds of students at this point. Many of them have become, have become union members. Um, we've had a lot of people who would have left Syracuse um, and gone down to New York City or gone out to L.A., but have chosen to stay to work with us for what we've done. We've just brought a tremendous amount of, of, of money into the local economy. Um, we hit a spot where it was like, I was just working just nonstop. It's just crazy. And I said to Will, I was like, I think we got to take a break and just kind of 
reassess what we're doing. And he's just like, yeah, but then what is everyone going to do? Right. Because what we didn't realize, what I never thought about was the responsibility that I had that I was taking on. And, and you know, there were, there were people who would quit, quit other jobs. They were flipping burgers or whatever they were doing to go work for you guys to go come work and yeah. their, for their dream, which is where you want to make movies. And now I was responsible for m- keeping that yeah. machine alive. Yeah. So that really, it was challenging. I mean, it was definitely, a, it's a, it is a tremendous amount of pressure. It was at times like, if I wasn't able to get a movie going, if there was no movie that was greenlit, I was feeling, I was feeling that beyond my own like career. Yeah. Because the American high business is not like just being totally candid. It's not currently, I'm not making money in that because everything that any, any dollar that I make is going right back into the business. Um, and we are growing so rapidly. We're Mm -hmm. working so quickly that it's just, um, we're just trying to keep. We're just. We're just. We're just making. You probably movies. breathed quite a bit of life back into that community. Not to mention, what do you? What do you create? Five hundred jobs every movie you make. A thousand jobs. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, yeah. I, a thousand might be um, a little bit high. High, maybe okay. five. I'll give you five hundred. Oh, okay. Um, that might be high too, but I have no idea. It's no, it's probably between it. like yeah. extras and and you know PAs and parking and locations and there's a, there's a catering. Um, there's a lot of jobs all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, and you know we're putting people in the hotels you know the local hotels are filled um we're renting cars from the local car company we're going out to the retreat every night that's a local spot in in uh in liverpool i'm just plugging you (laughs) um and really we're just having fun like for us it's about we're creating an environment where um people can feel like they're in a summer camp or they're back in high school for a lot of the actors never went to real high school because they were kid kid you know they were child actors and the experience that they're that we give them when they're over there is um we do everything we can to keep everybody laughing right and wow because our goal is to have people be like oh that was the greatest thing ever we're gonna come back and have the best time ever working on an american high movie we'll call people to be in our movies who, who have been in other movies and they're like yeah we don't care like just tell us wh- where to be and if I'm available, I'll come do it. Cause it's, we just, you know, we just try to have a good time. Vince know? came back and shot the binge for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he had a great time. We got, uh, Vince came and did the binge. He did, I think he did like 10 days on that movie. And I, we just had fun. I mean, it's just a kind of place where you, it's a little bit of like an independent, you have like an independent, like there's an independent spirit. Yeah. In the making of those films with a like kind of fucked up commercial like boss who just, um, you know, wants just people to laugh and have a good time. Well, I'm sure everyone doesn't have like a fancy trailer and it's not all. Yeah. No, there. Everyone gets like a teacher's lounge. Like <laughs> yeah, people right. like are in, you know, we make green rooms with like Nintendo 64, yeah. like in you know in in teach in old classrooms. Nobody has trail like right. nobody has trailers. No, we don't do. <clears throat> You know, we're lucky. Don Perignon in every trailer? That's yeah, cool. Don, That's why you're not making money, dude. We, the movie, like our lunch or what we did on Murder Mystery, you know, the lunch, one day of lunch on Murder Mystery can cover l- like an entire film of an American High film. It's just crazy. So, good uh, segue. So, Murder Mystery is the thing that you just recently directed. It's now a huge movie on Netflix. Adam Sandler. Dope. Mur- Sorry, Murder, Murder Mystery Two. Murder Mystery Two. Murder yes. Mystery One um, is very different. Yes. Um, and Kyle Newichek directed that. Um, a great film. Um, I got the opportunity. I was in Syracuse working on a movie called. I want to say it was called either Sex Appeal or Plan B. Um, and I got a call from my agents, uh, Mike Shiresky, um and Ramses Ishak. At William Morris, are they still there? No, they were at uh, UTA. They were, they were at UTA. They yeah. shift over. They've been my agents for many years. And um, they said, would you want to direct uh, Murder Mystery 2 with uh, Jennifer Aniston and, and Adam Sandler? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I had to then, I read the script and I had to like jump through. I had to like do interviews with, uh, you know, Netflix, the producers, the thing, like Jen and Adam. And then finally it was, you know, it was like, there it is. I'm rewriting the script and um, I'm going and 
traveling. I'm, I'm getting on private jets and I'm going down to the Caribbean and St. Lucia to scout out islands and flying all over the world like a paradise. It suddenly was a different type of, it was a different type of thing. Um, and I was doing that while running American, American High, High and yeah. like working with Will. And Will really just did such an incredible job of just man, he's always just just manning the fort while i'm going off and doing other other stuff but um yeah it was pretty incredible to to get the opportunity to, um to work on that movie and we shot in paris and in hawaii uh two pretty incredible spots um but what's interesting about those two locations um they're on the exact opposite side of the planet. So they're 12 hours away from each other and we had two separate crews. So while we were, so, so when we would shut down in Hawaii at the end of the day, I would, Paris would wake up and we'd start our zooms in Paris. So there was no sleep for all of crap. Never went dark oh, wow. technically. Never. Yeah. We were never dark. I would take like 20 minute cat naps here and there or just like pass out on zooms. <laughs> I would like to shut my my video off and be like, uh, and then you say, Jeremy, I'm like, yes, uh, yes, do that. Yeah, one. whatever you said, it sounds great. <laughs> um, but that was in, that was incredible. Um, I was I felt like I was again, like I felt like I was preparing for this giant movie with two of the biggest stars in the world. Um, one of whom was my idol from the time I was, you know, 15 years old, yeah. 14 years old in high school, watching on Saturday Night Live. Um, and I just, I was ready. I felt like I was ready to go and, um, I am going to crush this thing. And I, um, the night before it was a, the night before principal photography, I got a, a positive, I got COVID <laughs> and, uh, I was just like, Oh my gosh. And suddenly they came, I had like Ivy, I had like team Netflix, like flying it, people in like hooking me up to ivs we had like monitors set up in my hotel room like trying to just like pump stuff into me i could so i could tie a microphone that i could like talk to everybody on set so i directed the first the first week or three days uh in my from my room i hadn't met some of the actors i had only met over zoom and it was just it was, it wow. was crazy um it was not how i wanted to uh start off that movie in fact one when we were shooting i was a little bit out of it like why and I was watching on a monitor in my hotel room. I was like sitting on the couch and I was watching Jan and Adam do the scene. And I, I literally thought I was watching them. I was just like, oh, I'm watching a movie in my, on Netflix. And I, at some point they like turn and they're like, is someone going to cut? I was like, oh, sorry, cut. I, I forgot. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was, I, that was the last kind of two year and a half uh, of my life. Um, and uh, here, the movie came out three weeks ago. Yeah. It's uh, five weeks in a row on the top top uh, movies, top ten movies uh, in the world. Um, as you just heard in that confidential call. That no, yeah, don't know what out. you're talking about. Um, so I'm very proud of it. Um, and and now I'm here. What was it like working with Sandler? Did he meet all the expectations of your 15 year old self? Or he did. He's um he's incredible. He's yeah. um. He's so what what people don't realize or they don't realize about Adam is just how smart he is and how hard of a worker he is. He's very obviously he's super goofy right on screen and when he's performing and also when he's just hanging out um, because he is that person. But he's a worker. He's the first one in the office. He's the last one to leave. He, he is a perfection. He is he he wants every he's rewriting everything he wants you know shots in a very specific way he's he's very hands-on and um and uh it's great i learned so i mean he's been producing movies that are the top grossing movies in comedy for the last 30 years yeah. um so i just i mean it was it was film school for for me um and jennifer was a producer on the movie i'd worked with her on on the breakup and she was um integral in, in me getting hired to do this this uh this movie and she was she's incredible she's incredibly smart just just so professional um and those guys are you know when you're working with people like jen and adam and vince yeah um it's it's just it's so different from when you're working with a lot like a lot of the high school actors who i've been working with recently where it's just like 
it's their it's either their first movie or it's like their third movie or they had come from like the Disney space. Yeah. These guys just they know their marks. They know what they're doing. They know like that camera is looking this way. They know that this light needs to come. So they they're they've been doing it for so long that it just it was just an incredible learning experience and um and I loved it. I had a, I had a really good time. Did that make it easier for you or are you more stressed out as in like they know more than me? I need to like do this right. Listen, I, I mean, part of, you know, I, I learned so part of what I learned from my very first story about Joel Schumacher on day one is best idea wins, best idea wins. Yeah. And, you know, I gosh, like if somebody's pitching something that they feel strongly about and they're, you know, and it's a great like, great, let's try it. If someone then if it's someone who's pitching that who's arguably the funniest person on the planet like even if i didn't necessarily agree with it at yeah, the right, time right. like there are some there are some things in the movies that, in the movie where i'm like i just don't like that like it's just not my taste but okay let's just do it um and some of those things got the biggest laughs in the test you know people are like oh that's so funny like th this part's so funny i'm like all right he's the guy's right you can't argue with uh you know 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. Well, it sounds like you created a culture uh, where people are allowed to pitch an idea without being shot down, even if it's not the thing that's picked. Uh, people aren't afraid to come and give you some two cents to help make it better. That's, well, not, that's not always the case on film sets. Well, I think it's, uh, for, for me, I would create that culture. or I, That's the kind of culture that I love being around, yeah. whether it's playing football or, you know, it's, uh, f f I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm really good at, and I also know what I don't know. And for me, I'd rather surround myself with people who are the best in the business at the things that I don't know. Yeah. Um, and if the things that I'm, you know, the things that I feel really strongly about or, or that I know that I'm good at, um, I'll fight for those things yeah. because I'll know that I'm right. And if somebody can argue with me and prove me wrong, I look forward to that. You know? Yeah. I like being proven wrong. Yeah. Um, as long as it, the, the movie's as long as it's making the project or whatever we're right. working on better. So well, I think we had Wayne Kennan on and he said he was lighting something on Seinfeld and um Brian Cranston was like his first one of his first big movies. Oh, he played the oh yeah. He the played dentist. the dentist, dentist of course. Yeah. And the anti dentist. Cut, yeah, they yelled cut and somebody up in the rafters goes, "You know it'd be funny if you take a hit of the gas right before you go for in for Seinfeld." came from somebody up in the rafters greatest night now it's in there it's hilarious it was larry david up in the <laughs> yeah, probably probably, yeah. probably <laughs> but like why is that a problem like just put the best idea f i love it but you actually live that out you don't just say that that's great yeah i have to i mean you've you've met my wife so you know <laughs> i've not have to no i'm not. sorry tony's yeah. been my wife yeah we and, need um, to talk about that stuff don't we <laughs> yeah um yeah so always i have to listen and be open to all ideas What's uh What's coming down the pipe now? What are we? I'm just gonna be doing some some picketing. Yep. Um. No, we're actually doing. Um. We are two weeks out of our next American High movie. Uh. It's called Prom Dates, and it's um, it's uh, we're partnering with Kevin. Uh. Kevin Hart's gonna be our partner with it. Oh, very cool. Productions. Yeah. Uh. So we start that. Um. Then we're gonna go straight into a movie with uh, Vanessa Hudgens. Mm -hmm. Um. Called Summer of '69. Um. And then hopefully hopefully the strike will not last that long. Right. And we've got two or three others uh, lined up so that we can just keep going. Um, Are these being shot in eight weeks? They're usually 20, between 20 and 25 days okay. a piece. Um, and our system, we've got our system pretty down. So it's, it's makes it, it makes it easier where we yeah. don't have to spend there. You don't have the setup time. Right. right. You don't have the like, OK, who are we hiring for this? Where's the production office? Where's the where's like most of our locations are in our school. Yeah. So um, and if they're not in our school, we know where they are. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then massively efficient. Yeah. Yeah. We're, it's it's incredibly efficient um, and it's fun. And um, it's. It's yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Anything for you though, personally? Doing a lot of write, doing a lot of writing. Um, I've, I'm working on some passion projects. Okay. Uh, I think the the writers' strike will will uh, give me an opportunity to not only be out there supporting my fellow writers uh, at the picket lines, um, but also just be able to pull out some of those projects that I've been um, really wanting to Got it. to work on um, that have been passion projects that are not like paychecks. Um, yeah, yeah. So the Aaron Rodgers 
to the Jets story. The Aaron Rodgers to the yeah, Jets yeah. story. How, he's, how Aaron Rodgers wants he's a big to Jet, big Jets guy. copy Brett Favre in, yeah. in every way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm excited I mean, for I looked at Aaron you and Rodgers I thought, and the yeah. Jets. Are you going to do any cameos in your movies? I mean, <clears throat> Mr. Phillips does that. I do. Ross and Thurber does them in your movies. Yeah, come on. Yeah, I, What's uh, going on, Jeremy? You know what? I For some don't reason. Don't blame your ankle again. I, I don't know why. I've just, I have no, I've never done it and I've never felt the need or or i've never i've never wanted to um, you're from I, the yale not even one school. line even gary put himself in like one line not one line i you know what i don't know i really have no idea why i think it's more just like when i'm directing something i'm just like i'm very okay i'm very focused and i don't i'm also juggling so many things that i just i i don't know i i don't i don't I yeah. want to I don't know why. Maybe one day, but for now, we have a not. script, and um, you're perfect for the lead role. <laughs> Thank you so you much. I, I yeah. appreciate that. Um, one thing that actually is, you know, it's kind of <laughs> one of the things that we've been doing in with American High. It's just, it, which is kind of cool, um, and really outside of something that I I, I understood um, is uh, that Will started. It was called American High Shorts, and this he started it like he's like he pitched it to me like three months ago, and he's like, well, what if we started an incubator? Um, where we just we brought funny comedians to the school. We did it Saturday night li- Saturday night live style, and we just shot minute long content, uh, high school mm-hmm. related comedy things. And um, within three months, we're now at like four hundred twenty thousand followers oh, on wow. TikTok, Jeez. and like we're we're getting uh, we're now getting like offers to to advertise stuff. It's just one of those things where I'm like, oh, this is kind of the future and like how our business is changing on a yeah. day-to-day basis. Um, and, you know, people who are trying to get involved in sell scripts or become directors or actors, there's so much opportunity out there right now in terms of the technology and how you could get, how you could distribute your your stuff that, you know, when, when, when I was doing it, you had to, we had to get... Um, like a 35 millimeter camera yeah. and like you spend an insane amount of money to develop the film and do all like you, now the stuff that you could do on your iPhone in five seconds yep. is so, yep. it's just so crazy. Um, it just feels like we're, there's so much opportunity for, for young kids or anybody right now who, who, who wants to be a filmmaker or an actor or director. And that's, that's what we've been doing in, in American High Shorts. We actually, um, a few of the comedians who came and, and actors who did American High Shorts are now are, have just been cast in the upcoming oh, awesome. Kevin Hart movie. So it's a cool like launching pad yeah. and, and launching ground, launching pad. That's pretty, no, that something works. ground. Well, I mean, both. The, they're both. The the you done messed up a a Ron. I mean, with Key and Peele. A a Ron. That's that's just a one classroom. Like you could crank you know through several and see what see what you come up with. It's really fun. I mean, it's a it's a really cool. It's a really cool thing because we're creating, and when I say we, I'm not doing anything. Right. Our team is creating, um, just creating these fun characters yeah. that we could develop to do, you know, to do other things I love at that. some point down the road. We yeah. have one final question for you before we wrap things up, and I'll yes, let, let Angelo ask it. I had to cut. I had to go back to Yale uh, <laughs> to Yale the hospital, and they had to cut off the cast and give me a new cast. Did Got they it. use some hand sanitizer on there? Were they there some wet had, wipes? They, they definitely they had shave your gloves. leg. Did they say this was the first time this has ever happened to someone? You know what? I don't remember. It can't possibly be the first time that's ever happened to someone. All right. So normally what we do, uh, one last question as we wrap up this episode. Um, we ask everyone, just theoretically, if um, you had decided not to be a director, filmmaker, or whatever, you just, like, ah, this isn't for me, what do you think maybe you would have been doing uh, with the rest of your life if you hadn't gone down the film path? It's a good question. I mean, I think um, when I graduated from college, I was I was very much on the path of going out to Hollywood and, and making it in Hollywood. But a lot of my friends at the time were going to uh, Silicon Valley hmm. and, and kind of joining this tech thing that I thought was a, I didn't get, I was like, oh, this is a phase, you know, emails, um, what is it? Um, <laughs> 
I probably would. Looking back, I probably would have done something in 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 tech. Not um, I I don't I'm not good with numbers and, and, and stuff like that. Right. But I probably would have like been the guy who kind of put a bunch of people together in a house and just said, okay, let's solve this problem. Um, and I, I don't so know. Like, I probably would have done. So you would have started like OnlyFans or something. Yeah, yeah I would have definitely started thing. like OnlyFans. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm a business. I love business. So for me, everything that I you know everything that I write about is usually the main character is an entrepreneur doing something kind of right. out of the box. So like, you know, the wedding ringer is about a professional best man who's there for, you know, who's there, you hire him and come and make your wedding great. Um, in the breakup, Vince Vaughn uh, ran a three guys bus tours where they were, he was trying to build a bus company from from scratch with, yeah. his, with his brothers, three brothers bus tours. Where, Land, air, and sea. Hey, nice, beautiful job, Tony, I appreciate that. Um, so I always love, like I always write characters that are entrepreneurs um, who are kind of thinking outside of the, the box. So I, I imagine, and that's partially why I ended up buying a high school and starting uh, American High is because I would, decided to kind of live out a little bit of the characters that I always write. And, and write what you that. know, yeah. right? Um, so I, I definitely would have done something in, in the business world um, and hopefully solving a problem that the, the world... Um, the world was having um that would have been my goal and having fun doing it what i would do all right all right all right thought, thank you guys I, I, so much i thought he was gonna say math teacher <laughs> <laughs> um hand model you know those <laughs> hand model yeah. i appreciate it guys this has hey, been awesome for having this me. has been awesome dude thanks for dropping all of those stories yeah. appreciate you being here um we're gonna sign off now thank you everybody for tuning in to another episode of so how'd you get here check out uh the full episode in the link below there's no good link just click on the youtube video yeah. youtube itunes um, spotify YouTube, something like that all right? those okay google well, play anyway coming at you from uh hollywood california go out Support the writers. Uh, that's going to be it for this week, and we will see you next time. Have a good day, everybody. Woo!